Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16 to 20. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma, and it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Anna Carter Florence, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers will include William Barber II, Lauren Winner, Robert Wright, Yolanda Pierce, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Register by February 15 to receive an early bird discount. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the second Sunday of Christmas on January 2nd, 2022, are Jeremiah 31, 7 through 14, Psalm 147, 12 through 20, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and John 1, 1 through 18. Although there's an option to drop verses 1 through 9. I suppose if you did that, you would have Caroline Lewis to reckon with in your email inbox on Monday morning. That is January for sure. 3rd. Don't you it's dare not always every year drop. we get to Sundays of Christmas. So happy second Sunday of Christmas to everyone. And we were just talking about that the second Sunday of Christmas is always these texts. So we were, and I thought, really, always? And that's because we don't often have a second Sunday of Christmas. So we have a little bonus here. Uh, so Merry Christmas to our listeners once again. Yeah, Merry Christmas. And these are Merry all winners Christmas. when it comes to texts. They are, uh, particularly the John text. <laughs> <laughs> Some winners are more winner than others. Yes, exactly. So, of course, we have John 1, 1 to 18, the prologue to John's gospel. I like to call it uh, John's birth story, if you will. John's, of course, it's John's Christmas story. So much in this passage, uh, of course, that you can take forward in the Gospel of John, but the, the key here is, again, how does this passage sound on this second Sunday of Christmas, January 2, 22? What is resonating with us this year in this uh, second Christmas pandemic, and what are the words of hope and promise that this passage uh, can uh, can speak about? And so I, a couple of things that I'll start off with and see what the two of you think, but I was really struck uh, in particular by uh, the in the beginning, <laughs> which seems kind of obvious, you know, it's in the beginning and the beginning of a new church year or beginning of a new year. So January 2nd, and everybody's sort of, you know, imagining what this new year is going to bring for many, many reasons, always the, always the new year's resolutions, but will this, will this year be different, uh, particularly as we've experienced 21 and uh, nine and 20 and maybe the promise of, of those words in the beginning in this passage, uh, which uh, takes us back to the words of Genesis and, and returns us to or reminds us of God, the creator, and that, uh, and we move into that theme, of course, verses uh, two through four, but God, God is about new creation. God is about, uh, God is about 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 creating and maybe that is a place to start where 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 are you seeing new creation even though that's maybe particularly harder this year uh but where are you seeing new creation where do you see those that that characteristic of god in your own life or or what are you hoping for what are you hoping will be recreated or created anew in, in this new year that this text speaks about that promise. So that's a first homiletical direction I would, I would suggest. We don't have to answer that, do we? Nope. Oh, we, okay. we can move on. I'm just. 
That's my first, that's my first thought. I do, however, have other thoughts. Uh But I, you know, I read this this year and thought, um, you know, for me, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke have got this kind of, especially Matthew and Luke obviously have this kind of historical situatedness, right? With, with names of rulers and locations and travel and flight. Uh, Luke in particular, like situating this in history. And John, of course, sounds like it could be removed from history in so many ways in terms of how this happens. And John expands the time back to the creation. But I also heard something in this this year about Jesus and his own impermanence. Um, the, like John is, is blunt almost from the beginning that Jesus will die and will go away. And of course, all of the the talk about the giving of the paraclete is how do you survive a life now without Jesus? Because he has to go away. He's the son of man who descends, which we celebrate at Christmas time, but also the son of man who reascends. And even that notion of the, the word of God becoming flesh and tabernacling among us is a sense of impermanence. Uh, I've never, I've ne- <laughs> all right, cards on the table. I've never liked that the, 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 the paraphrase moved into the neighborhood because that's really not what this is about. It's, it's um, this idea of a temporary existence among us. Of course, in John's theological view, Jesus stays among us, or is born, uh, the spirit bears witness to Jesus among us, and he continues to empower us and be present. But it's this kind of preciousness of Christmas, right? It's the way in which uh, life is impermanent and which the gift of Christmas is something that surely changes everything for all time. But it's not a promise of cute baby Jesus around to hold on to for the entire year. You know what I mean? That there's something about. So I'm glad this is not Christmas Eve. I'm glad this is January 2nd. (laughs) Not that I'm in too much of a hurry to get to Lent and Holy Week. But there's something that's that's kind of it's really subtle in there. But I don't know. That's Mm -hmm. that's what kind of struck me, especially in a time where there's so much death. There's so many transitions. There's so much of a sense of. of, of community becoming less permanent. People are, are changing jobs at a rapid rate in our societies. Yeah, how do we deal with that? Mm-hmm. That's my homiletical crack to start to work my way into. It's very different for me to approach this text as a one-off in the middle of uh, syn- some synoptic year then uh, this is in the in the narrative lectionary. Uh, you know, we start this, and then you're going to be in John all the way through Easter. It's very different uh, for me here, and so uh, I don't know what direction to go. But um, but one thing that I'm wondering about is the word fullness. So from His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. I think the 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 um, We've talked before about just grace upon grace and how the word grace, uh, grace and truth here, and then grace upon grace, but it doesn't happen a lot. But we can imagine, I mean, in John, but then we can imagine each scene in John as an, as an example, an instance of people receiving grace upon grace. But the fullness, I assume that has to do with some sense with the incarnation. But what, do you, what are you guys' sense of what does that mean from his fullness? Well, I think it. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, the uh, you know this coming after John one fourteen, right? Because it's John one sixteen. That that this act of God of becoming flesh is is uh, an expression or a revelation of God that is that somehow John is pointing to really does reveal the fullness of God's love or the, the expansiveness of God's commitment to God's people and, uh, and the, and the extravagance of God's love and God's grace and what that's going to mean for us. And so this, I, to me, that's one inkling I have is that that fullness refers to, it's a reference back to the incarnation, the word became flesh. Uh, and and as, uh, as Matt said, that temporality of 
entering into our existence and entering into human existence, which is only, which is going to be a, a, a temporary one. Uh, and so I think that is, that's, that's how I would answer it initially is that, that, that fullness is, is a reference to uh, that, that act of God. Uh, and, and it's an act of, and it's an act of God. We'll see in verse 17, the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, that the law, and that that's not a, that's not a supersessionist claim. That's not a, a discounting the law of Moses claim that that is, that is meant to communicate the continuity of God, that, that the, the fullness we are talking about here is the God's, God's, uh, the continuity of God's self-revelation, the covenantal nature of God's existence, uh, that, that, that we are, that that fullness goes back to that, to the very beginning of God's commitment to God's people. And that's continuing now. And so, and that's, and that, and then the word flesh really has a different kind of resonance in that, it's, uh, it's, it's flesh. I've always, I always point that out when I'm talking about John, it's not anthropos, it's flesh. And so there's that, there's that expansiveness there, but that, uh, that, that became flesh that that's another way. I think that John is connecting the entirety of God's salvific activity, um, all the way back to, back to the beginning. <laughs> and so that's, yeah, that's where I would, go. that's what I think about that. Yeah, there's no diminishment of the word by taking on flesh or by becoming flesh. Um, taking on is, I think, even too small of a term, right? By becoming flesh. And the same word that's present at creation, right? Nothing came into being apart from him. I mean, all of these massive cosmic claims nevertheless have a payoff, right? That fullness is still just as full, right? just as powerful in one incarnated human being uh, and it benefits each person, right? We've all each received, we've all received um, grace upon grace. So I've kind of taken it as that, right? That there's, I'm, I'm, I'm very close to saying that the finite might contain the infinite, but of course I'm not gonna go that far, but um, cause it can't, but, uh, but nevertheless, right? That there's nothing, there's nothing lost in the richness and the power of this word. Except for in Jesus, it does. Right. That's the one of the things that I noticed, just obviously, because I'm reading this material usually against the, the other set of texts that I'm reading it for is uh, against is the Old Testament. Um, and so when it talks about fullness right after glory, I mean, those two terms go together so often, you know, it's be filled with glory, you know, um, and so, you know, that all the earth is full. And, and so glory and fullness are concepts that work together in uh, the Old Testament. And so that's so, Carolyn, when you point out, we've just had glory, right? Uh, in 14, we have seen his glory, the glory of Father's only son, and that then glory is full. Where is that full? It's it's made full in Jesus. And that, yeah, and that fullness and that glory is not, it's not going to be fully seen until really the ascension. That's where it, um, that's where we, you know, that, that glory is the entirety of the, of the incarnation promise. And so, um, and so that, that's where the, that's where that fullness is going to be. It's going to be um, re fully revealed. Uh, the, the, one, the other thing I want to note about this too, in this conversation, which I, which is really interesting is that, and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. Uh, it, 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 I, I was struck by that this, this time around. It's not, I have seen his glory. You know, it's not John narrating his, his uh, you know, this first person account, uh, but that, that move to a first person plural, uh, that this is, he's not this, you know, this spectator, but that, but narrating a community's experience of God. And I think that that's, there's a real uh, importance in that, that this is, particularly as we move forward in John and you get John 3.16 for God so loved the world, that this is going to call for uh, the, 
a, a communal uh, a communal witness or a communal testimony, and I think maybe that would be another direction that the the preacher could go, particularly, or even the preacher could think of herself. In that, you know, there's always this commentary around what on earth is John the Baptist doing in the middle of this, you know, cosmic birth story. You have, uh, <laughs> you have John, you know, John poking his head here. And what is John doing here? And but it's a reminder of of what I what at this point I would say. What is our what is our response to Christmas? What is our calling in response? What is our communal calling going forward when the rest of the world forgets about Christmas? Um, how is it that we are going to, as a, as a Christian community, give witness to uh, this, this, the temporality of God, the, the temporariness of God uh, at this time and place? And, uh, and, and that, and that's really where the preacher stands, sort of in between this this atemporal and temporal word. That uh, that's what we navigate uh, throughout the week, as you have this atemporal word, this word that's coming from God, and yet is entering into uh, and getting embodied in a community. And I would also invite preachers to to think of that that space and place this week too, and maybe maybe call the community into that space of John the Baptist uh, when we think about the, the meaning forward of what Christmas, of what Christmas is all about. We should probably move on, save a little bit of John one okay, for the next fine. time we get a second Sunday after Christmas. Um, but Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah during the Christmas season, kind of like that. <laughs> A real different mood to this text, obviously, with, uh, you know, John's glory and wonder. And here you've got a sense of a real acknowledgement of loss and pain um, preceding a restoration. And the lingering effects of some of that loss and pain. Some yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it would be interesting to, uh, surprise, surprise, add a verse uh, or two in order to make it um, sort of resonate more with john it, john 31 starts off um, i mean jeremiah 31 thank you jeremiah 31 starts I know, off it's it easy says, to go it's easy to default to john <laughs> i understand that completely. yeah especially chapter 31 right chapter 31 uh, of john yeah at that time i will be the god of all the families of israel and they shall say to me thus says the lord the people who survived the sword have found grace in the wilderness. I mean, uh, so it'd be interesting just to, to go back to that as a way to make the texts resonate a little more before getting to the, um, um, the, the section that's picked up, which is I think where the word, uh, you know, in verse nine we get, but with weeping they shall come in and with consolations I will lead them back. This part of John is called the book of consolations, I think because of that verse and the theme, but I really appreciated. Um, and I don't always, by the way, I appreciate my little brother, but I, I appreciated that uh, the commentary uh, <laughs> Carl filled in for, uh, for somebody who wasn't able to complete their um, submission or their contract with us. And um, one of the things that he picked up, I thought is the mixed emotions of both joy and sadness together. Um, and I just started thinking about that theme and how often that is true in our lives and how often that is true in the biblical story. Like when they rebuild the temple after the exile, there's celebration, but the people that remember the old one are weeping and, you know, you couldn't tell the sound of joy from weeping. And, um, as at, you know, at this time of year, um, uh, my Carl and I, uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of our mom's death. And so, around funerals, how you, you get together and you mourn, and then you tell all these hilarious stories. And so funerals and then anniversaries of that are, are memorials in which uh, weeping, you know, bitterness and gladness are, are mixed together. And how well that does capture, I think, celebrations even at the time of Christmas. Oh, I think that's true. I think that, that uh, particularly, again, this Christmas where, uh, where we are existing in a place of of both and uh, and both celebration, but also a lot of still separation and death and 
uh, and so having a text that captures that and that, that gives the preacher a space to talk about that, I think is important. I also liked, speaking of your little brother, I also liked uh, the way in which he used those, the five R's, maybe that's the preacher in me, <laughs> the alliteration and the uh, rhetorical flair of the five R's, but I think there could be also something with that too, uh, with this, well, it certainly is something with this passage that a, that a preacher could really focus on those five R's and the way in which, uh, the way in which those five R's have, uh, have been, uh, have been a part of our lives and, and what that means. So that would be, I like that a lot. I wonder if this year, and every congregation will have to judge this for themselves, but how much of a sense of discouragement will be in the air on the second Sunday of Christmas after well, a number of things, not just the pandemic, but uh, the, where Christmas falls this year being on, on a Saturday and then church right after, and now we've got the day after New Year's Day. I mean, there could be some empty congregations, I guess is my point, or some people who are fretting about numbers on Christmas Eve, perhaps not being as high as they were and Hmm. frustration of that so this whole cycle of of of, uh, of restoration remnant and not getting it right but you know then being returned and restored uh isn't just a story about jeremiah's time although we have to locate it there i think but it's also the church's story and it's about finally god's faithfulness um and so to help people who are worried about loss decline shrinking numbers disappointment discouragement exhaustion ask the question where do we where do we grow in this where do we find god's grace in the midst of this ongoing struggle yeah. there's a it's christmas so psalm they're all christmas psalms for all they're all gifts under the tree 147 they're not all christmas psalms 147 this one's not my favorite i'm just no. gonna say that i don't like it when it says who can stand before god's cold because <laughs> that scares me that thinks that makes me think that god is able to get my attention by dropping the temperature severely which i would prefer god not do <laughs> i'm um i'm picking that up what verse is that in? my my access to our website right now crashed this it's is 147 so, 12 through 20 but that's verse 17, verse 17. pearls down hail yeah. like crumbs who, who can, can stand, stand before, before his cold? His cold. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I terrifies I, me. I do like these um, psalms towards the end that do talk about, like you know, a stormy, stormy wind obeying his command and things like that. Um, some of those uh, phrases, the uh, especially if you think about you know this coming, this psalm coming from an arid, uh, hot cl uh, climate. It's uh, it's really interesting to find to find this kind of language there. But yeah, I know what you mean about the cold. I'm not a fan of cold anymore. I mean, obviously I think a preacher has to contextualize Jerusalem in this because it's such a part of the Psalms energy is insular, right? God strengthens the bars of your gates. God will grant peace within your borders. I mean, it has this sense of us against the world that uh, certainly makes sense if you know the history. Uh, but the dangers of people just picking that up and reading it as somehow a, a word to them in their current geopolitical context, uh, which is kind of hard to do probably on the second Sunday of Christmas when people are like, we came to, we came to sing, didn't come for a 20 minute sermon. Um, let's talk about that. You know, I, I suspect the reason this Psalm is here is because of its focus on the word. And so what you get in, Verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth, but actually the word command is uh, the word word. Um, and then his word runs swiftly. The other word, the, the word. word he, oh, the it's not, the but word. there's it's pa parallelism. So they're near synonyms. Yeah, they're basic synonyms. But um, when you get words like command or promise uh, in Hebrew, they're almost they're, they're, they're using that two different words are the same word. So you're getting word. And um, commands a bad word. Utterance might be better. Um, and then verse again, verse 18, he sends out his word. That is the same. Uh, that's Debar again. But so, and his word to Jacob, that the, the play with what God does through the word is, uh, I think, really important in picking, picking apart the um, 
poetry of the of, of the poem uh, to try to understand what it's saying and, and how that then connects with John. Uh, in we didn't talk much about that, you know. In the beginning was the word. Um, so. So if if that was a direction that you went, then you could make some connections. I think then to the yep. psalm. Yeah. Yeah. And Ephesians. But especially, I'll just say one other thing about that. I mean, notice that. I mean, is um, as as you're focusing on what John is doing with the word made flesh in Jesus, that um, the concept here is that there is natural law in the sense that nature itself, it, uh, God, God's being is the first act of God's being is to hold creation together and sustain it from moment to moment. And the way God does that is with the word. All right. Ephesians. Well, I think another, another one-off another like guest appearance from Ephesians before it before we go into things away. Yeah. Before. Yeah, that's it. And then we move into Corinthians uh, later on in Epiphany, but but I, the first thing I, I thought about with this particular passage is that like these are the these are the ongoing results of Christmas, or this is, these are the effects of Christmas, if you will. Uh, that I mean, or it could be even a summary of what the incarnation is. Uh, yet and yet in a different kind of language and sort of confessional claim have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places uh, destined for us as adoption of his children. Uh, and then we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. I mean, it, it just, it, it continues Christmas into, you know, the entirety of Jesus ministry and Jesus death and resurrection. And, and so it, you know, to, I, I think you could use it, use, you could use it liturgically, but also just to, to, to say, you know, what difference does Christmas make? Like, what, what are we saying when, when we confess the, the good news of great joy? And, and this is one answer to that. Uh, this is one possible answer to what does it mean? Uh, what are those lingering ongoing realities of what, of, of the birth of Jesus?